Hi and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly Q&A session. You get involved in the comments down there, ask us tech related questions, could be about archive stuff, retro stuff, stuff of the future that doesn't exist yet, hydraulic stuff, mechanical stuff, anything goes really, anything tech at all. And it could be directed at presenters as well, not just myself and Anna, uh, it could be the EMBN crew or the GMBN crew. Get involved down there and you might feature on next week's show. First question this week, which cracked me up, was, um, well, I've titled this Fake SRAM Access. This is great. So it's from John T. Blaine. It says, after watching your SRAM Access video, I saw some cheap lookalike stuff on AliExpress. Have you experienced, um, have you any experience with that stuff? How bad can it be? And it literally is, it's so coincidental that you like got this question in because Neil literally put this on my desk the other day, which is a, um, as you can see by the fact it's got a removable battery here on the back is a rear derailleur that's wireless, battery powered, and that is their uh, shifter touch point, that mammoth sized block that hangs off the bars. Anyhow, this is hilarious. I'm gonna read some info from the website here. Mountain bike 12 speed derailleur GX Eagle access upgrade kit. Doesn't look anything like access to me. <coughs> and this is how they describe it, access controller with clamp, one piece, battery, two piece, USB data cable, one piece, power adapter, one piece. The GX access rear derailleur shifts on command, whether under climbing load or sprints into the stage finish. It is smart enough to protect itself thanks to its incredibly resilient overload clutch. Yeah, this one doesn't have an overload clutch. It doesn't have any smart features. It doesn't have an app. Um, it's fairly rudimental. And more worryingly is it costs nearly the same as buying the real thing, so I'd, I'd actually have to say, why would you? I've not put this on a bike yet, but, as you see, it works. Quite a bit of delay, and the delay gets worse the more gears you try and go through. But it will do multi-shifts, and you can snap this up for the bargain price of uh, what GX Eagle pretty much costs. Also, to go along with it, you have the uh, concern of charging these unnamed batteries. Yeah, I actually did this in a saucepan, just in case they caught fire, because quite frankly, I don't trust them. Uh, now, this isn't a thing standing up for access, but honestly, when you've got companies as big as SRAM and Shimano developing battery technology for use in bikes, you've got to wonder when another company puts something out um, with no track record, hey, it might be really good and we will try it to see, but I just don't see why you would. Anyone else tried an alternative shifting system out there? Uh, I'd love to know if you have. Right, next up from King Kunj 190. Do you reckon wheel sizes will get bigger than 29er? God, I hope not. I really hope not. Those daft buggers over on GCN have built a 36 inch wheel bike. It's got drops on there at the moment, but I've asked our mechanic to put some flat bars on it. He obviously needs to get new controls for it as well. Just so we can try it, just for a laugh but the wheels on it weigh an absolute ton. And yeah, all right, you could build lighter ones, but really, do you, do you need to? 29 inch wheels, I think are at the upper end of what you can get away with with, with handling off-road. Now, when I, when I talk about handling, I mean turning into tight turns and that, and even then, some people say 29 is too much, which is why the whole mullet wheel style setup thing has become a thing, because people are like trying to crave back the sort of the swift handling associated with smaller wheels, but retain the stability and the overriding features that you get with the bigger wheels. I really hope not, um, but, I really want to ride that 36 inch wheel bike because I think it'd be hilarious. I reckon you could just ride upstairs like it's a ramp. We'll see. Um, next one from Fire McCannon. What bike sprays are safe to spray where? E.g. MO94 in linkages, bottom bracket, etc. Okay, so all the major sprays on the market can be used on your chains, transmissions, things like that, but you, you need to kind of understand what the actual sprays do because some are solvent, some are water displacers, some are a combination of things, and some are lubricants. Some have lubricant within them, but won't necessarily lubricate apart. Now with the muck off stuff, you'll see some shots on screen. So you've got MO94, Bite Protect, and then of course the spray lubes. There's a dry lube, a wet lube, and I think there's an all conditions lube as well, but we're just gonna to refer to those last three as chain lubes for now. So MO94 is a general lubricant. Sort of stuff you just want to keep around your house is generally water displacing, it's got corrosion inhibitors, it's lubricating, and it's 
got like a light film that it leaves. So if your door hinges are creaky or whatever, it's a good all round spray to use and you can use it on your bike. MO, sorry, Bike Protect is kind of the next level. It's a real heavy duty water displacer, but also leaves, as well as doing everything MO94 doesn't, leaves a non-sticky film, like a non-sticky residue. So it's particularly good to use on your bike after you've washed it, because you can give your bike a bit of a polish with it. Obviously don't get it anywhere near your brakes and it means stuff's gonna be less likely to stick to it. So that's a really good thing. And then the spray chain loops, as you may imagine, are spray chain loops. Now, outside of Muckoff, the main product you'll probably know of in the spray format is WD-40. Now, it stands for Water Displacer 40 because they took 40 different sort of versions to get to that one, uh, which became their ultimate one. Now, yes, it's a water displacer. Yes, it's got corrosion inhibitors. Yes, it's got lubricants in there, but it's also got solvents in there. You spray that near bearings, that gets in there and starts breaking down the grease and stuff on the inside of the bearings. So you need to think about this sort of stuff. So I did speak to Lewis at Muckoff and what he said was, great question. I would stay away from any chain lube sprays as they're far too tacky and viscous. So it's gonna pull the dirt and the grime in towards the pivot. So if you're spraying them around your pivots and stuff, then that's kind of not ideal. Um, after a wash, use something like Bike Protect to drive the water out. MO94 is good as well because it puts a protective film on. Um, so yeah, depending on which one you wanted to go for. As most bearings are sealed, using sprays in linkages and bearings isn't doing a lot. It's just masking the creak or the squeak until later. If it's got to this stage, it's going to be a strip down, a clean and a re-grease kind of job. Um, well yeah, there you go. So yes, technically you can use some of those things around linkages, but you're either gonna make a problem worse or you're just masking a problem that really needs a service or fresh bearings or something retorking. Basically in there, uh, there you go. Next one, how do I know if my chain is ready for a placement without it being broken and cleaned regularly? Uh, simple, get yourself a chain wear indicator tool. Um, here's a new one and there's also an old one to show you just a couple of different styles. Now they simply measure the distance, basically the pitch between the chains um, will technically never change um, because you can't physically stretch a chain link. But what happens is those round, round bits that go around, the rollers, they will get bored out internally and they'll get a bit baggy. And over time, it means that the pitch effectively kind of changes. We're talking like a minute amount. If you can replace your chain just before that starts to change, then it won't have worn out your cassette or your chain ring, yeah? So therefore then you can get another chain's worth of use out of your cassette and your chain ring. If you wait until it's worn, the good chance then is you'll have started hooking the chain rings a tiny bit and it will definitely have worn the cassette in which case you're gonna to need to replace at least one of the other components. So that is the best way you can do it. Get yourself a chain weight indicator tool. There's loads of brands on the market and it will definitely save you cash at some point. Go for it. Uh, next up from the Spanner Chimp. Hello Spanner Chimp, I recognize your name, you're in the comments quite frequently. Have you tried the Vittoria Sierra tires yet? Uh, the more Trail XC type tire. We're thinking of getting one for winter as I run Barzos all year round on your recommendation. Uh, yeah, I have tried them and it's a really good tire. I love the profile of them. I love the tread on them. I love the feel of the tire, um, the way it cuts into the terrain. It works great in winter. To be fair, it works great all year round. The one issue I have for the tire for what I look for is I can't get the feel of the tire uh, to be the way I want it to. Now I'm 92, 93 kilos, so there is this is something to take into account with this. For that tire to work its best, you need to run it at low pressure. The whole reason it has the thicker casing on there is to run it basically at a lower pressure to gain additional grip that you can't get from a traditional cross country tire like the Barzo. So I run my Barzo's probably 30, 31 pounds, something like that in the tires, but because they're such thin supple casing, they feel much softer and suppler than they actually are. With the Sierra, um, sorry, going back to the Barzo again, and I run them like that, not only to help protect the rim on the bike, but also because of the way I like to ride, even on a cross country bike, I like to push the bike into things to move around, like it's a bit more aggressive the way that you move on the bike. And as a result, if I was running those tires softer, you end up folding the tire around. Now the Sierra is designed to run softer. So if you run softer tires, you are gonna love that tire. It's just not what works for me. Um, I definitely don't go on the softer side of things. Hopefully that makes sense. 
it's a great tyre, no doubt about it. Uh, and I think it's uh, going to be a really popular tyre too, but just not quite for me as it is at the moment. Um, next up is from Traster, another one. Most manufacturers spec large disc brake rotors on the front, smaller at the rear. Industry experts are now saying that it makes more sense to have the big rotor on the back brake. Thoughts? Okay, well just to be clear, no one here is saying you should have a smaller rotor on the front. There's just a characteristic thing of having, say, a 180 and a 160 or a 180 and a 203 style setup with your disc brakes. And the, the idea behind that is that when you're going down the descent, you've got more weight on the front wheel, which means you can load the front wheel more and in theory use more braking power so people go for a disc rotor with more power. So there's kind of two schools of thought on this. Now this is just the way I think about this. So yeah, a bigger rotor equals more power, but that's not necessarily a good thing. If you're riding on lesser terrain, now if you have a 200 or 203 mil rear rotor and you're riding very average terrain, it's suddenly gonna become very easy to lock up the rear wheel. Now if you struggle with hand pain and things like that, then actually this might be a thing that's good for you. But in my opinion, if you're riding fairly tame or fairly average terrain and it's too easy to lock up the wheel, you're out of control when you're locking up the wheel anyway, it's not doing anything to slow you down. The slightly smaller rotor is more usable. So my theory is to run a 180 and a 200 or 203 for my usual terrain. And when I go abroad to bigger trails or somewhere where I need to be on the brakes a lot more, I'll run equal size rotors front and rear. And actually I've stepped up to 220. Uh, I did that earlier year for that Magura video, running the bigger rotor. Man, the difference that made was unbelievable. Now, one of the things that you'll probably have heard these industry experts talking about is the fact that you use your rear brake more than you think. Now, what they're referring to is when you're riding the back brake. Now, this is something that happens on longer Alpine style runs, where literally if you're off the brakes, you're almost out of control straight away. You're kind of half on the brakes most of the time. So that's called like running the back brake, basically, or riding the back brake when you're literally dragging it. And in that case, then yeah, a bigger rotor is definitely more beneficial. So yeah, all right, you're still gonna lock up that back wheel, but it means you can run it just to squeeze the modulation and basically scrub off speed with that bigger brake. And you're talking about going a lot faster here as well than that home terrain. So I guess the thing is that yeah, it does depend on who you are and what you're doing. A heavier rider might need bigger brakes, arguably. If you're riding faster, you will need bigger brakes accordingly but it's not always the right thing. Remember, if you're locking up a wheel, it's not doing much. Just remember that, that's really important. And the last question this week is from Cross2862. Why is the standard tubeless setup process to, to pour sealant in a tubeless tire before replacing the tire all the way around the rim? Why not put the tire all the way on, blow it, make sure it seats properly on the rim, then remove the valve core, use an injector to inject sealant that way. Wouldn't it reduce chances of spilling all over the place? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And in fact, when Stan's No Tubes did their first ever tutorial on setting up their No Tube system, I think they pretty much did that. You, you set it up dry as such. And I have referred to that in the past in Tubers videos, like that is the correct way of doing it. You set it up dry, therefore there's no wastage if it's not gonna inflate first time. But I think the point trying to make is with more modernized setups, so rim size is a bit more accurate now, the tires tend to be a better fit. You're mostly, I'd say probably 90% chance of getting it up perfectly first time, in which case, make it easy for yourself, just get it all done in one. But absolutely, you are correct. Um, it is reducing the chance, and it is technically the correct way of doing it. Uh, but it's quite a long, laborious way of doing it, not undermining the fact you said it's the correct way. Um, but I guess people are impatient, they just want the fastest possible way to do it as well. But hey ho, there we go. Uh, that's another ask in the bag. Uh, please do get involved in the comments down there and we'll come back to you for the next week's show. Take care.